Friday, June 13th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we talk about one of our favorite manga, Eagle, making of an Asian American president. Let's do this. You know, it's kind of scary, but I'm feeling slightly more and more like a semi-legitimate journalist the longer we do this. What do you mean, legitimate? Well, as in, you know, long ago, before we were internet famous, if I had any sort of problem or difficulty or anything with anyone out there in the world, other than asking them, you know, hey, uh, what's up? I really had no recourse, and I just had to let things go. Uh, Now, uh, last week, we went on a little bit of a rant about the difficulties we've had talking to Otakon, and within an hour of uploading the show... Uh, more than one staffer emailed us and answered most of our concerns. Why didn't they do that before? I don't know. They're having some trouble, but it looks like everything's back in order. And a lot of the things that hadn't been announced yet will be announced shortly, actually. Yeah, it's still definitely too late. I mean, it. I mean, it's not too late like, oh no, the con is doomed too late. But it's definitely, you know, beyond the deadline of... Uh, announcing who's got what panels and when and, and that kind of business. See, luckily, people it's People really... need to know this stuff like four months in advance. Well, luckily, normal people do. We don't because we have pretty much a loadout of 10 or so panels we can do pretty much on 24 hours notice. Yeah, it still kind of sucks, though, and uh, hopefully it will not happen again. Yeah, well, it and looks an, like... At any con. It looks like everything's going okay so far, though I did very specifically now, and I think to the right people, offer... To have myself and Scott and the rest of our crew handle the panels for Oticon next year. We'll see if they follow up on that because they haven't answered me yet. Yeah, the thing is, if they let us do it, it'll be a question of, are they going to say, here's what you have to do, do exactly this, or do the panels the way you want? Because if they just let us do the panels the way we want, it'll be awesome. But if they make us do it the Oticon way, it won't be as awesome. I don't know what you mean by the Oticon way. It seems like every panels person handles it differently. The only real concern is that you have to deal with you have to put in all the industry and the guest panels and all those things then you fit the fan panels around that other than that you can pretty much i'd assume pick whoever you want yeah it it just you know it seems like otakon is a convention at least from my perspective that is a lot more group decision making whereas some other cons are sort of delegating the decision making and then people can do as they wish with the power granted to them See, I don't know. I I did get the impression that the panels person was at least somewhat independent in years past. Yeah, yeah. But uh, But at least, in the very least, we can't really reveal anything. But remember, one of the questions we had was, so what's the musical act? Why hasn't Otakon said anything about the musical act? I really want to know, because the musical act is often the highlight of the con for me. I I just, that's the kind of thing I really love. And uh, we can't really say who, partly because we don't really know. But it looks like, from a confirmed source... They're going to have two musical acts this year. Well, they had two musical acts last year. Yeah, but they're going to have two again this year. And from what they say, it looks like it's something that not everyone is probably going to expect. But the words, I expect it to be quite lovely, are in here. Uh, I'm really excited, I gotta say. I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't know. We'll have to see what it is before I can say whether I'm happy about it or not. I, I don't just, I can't get excited about these mystery things anymore. There was a good rant someone had recently on a blog. They were like, stop with the fucking countdowns. You know, people go out and they're like, you know, they make a website like, coming soon, this thing. And then they'll have a timer. You know what that says? All you're saying is, this thing is going to happen. You're not giving out any information at all. You're you're basically saying nothing. Stop doing that. Either say something or get off the freaking soapbox. But that's uh, basic PR. I mean, say you're running for, I don't know, it's relevant tonight, President of the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you just one day announce, I'm running for president, you get a big press brouhaha, and then that's it, and you disappear from the limelight. But if you follow the elections and the primaries and everything, you'll notice that most candidates, first they'll announce their intention to put together an exploratory committee to consider the possibility of being president. Then they'll announce that the the exploratory committee is going to be created a week from X day. Then they announce it was created. Then they announce it's working. Then they announce that they're going to make an announcement. Then that announcement, they usually announce that they've decided whether or not they're going to run. Then they announce the day they're going to say if they're going to run or not. And then, eventually, they might say they're going to run. 
Some of them haven't really said it yet this this time around. See, but you can still maintain that, you know, build up of slowly releasing information and having many announcements. But and they, don't, creating they didn't hype. release anything but, at but, all. But I mean, you could still do that, but actually say something each time. Like, let's say I'm putting out a video game, right? I can come out like a year before the game is going to be released and say, I'm going to make this game. Then the next week, I could say, the game is going to be in this genre. And then the next week, I can say, the game is going to be on these systems. And I won't have some stupid countdown where I just say nothing and waste everyone's time and attention and, you know, such with nothing. But I can still, by withholding information, saying things, fewer things over a period of time, get the same PR effect, but not be annoying with a stupid, here's a clock. Yeah, I have a clock in my house. Thank you very much. Get the way. Nah. <laughs> There's better news for me to read. See, well, like, take the example of uh, Smash Brothers, the new game coming out on the Wii. If I were Nintendo, how I would have done this countdown is N weeks before the game is going to be released, or maybe N days, it depends, probably weeks, as long as I get the schedule down, N being the number of characters in the game. Exactly. I would have revealed one character I would have done, every week. I would have done maps before that. I would have done maps and then characters. Uh, you know that really, uh, what you should do is just go pixels. Ah, <laughs> have, have have this big screenshot, and each day one pixel of the screenshot appears. One random one. Yeah. One. Or actually, I'd make it uh, dynamic, Ajaxy, real time. Like every minute, a pixel appears, and it's just a big image. And then once one picture's done. Another picture starts up, and you keep the archive of all the old pictures. You got to do something clever like that. Yeah, something that actually gives information. I don't care if you're withholding information. I don't care if you're releasing information artificially slowly for marketing purposes. That's expected. It's sort of necessary. Just don't make an announcement that's nothing. Don't make these announcement that you're going to make an announcement. Don't do that. Don't say nothing. Say at least something so that I didn't waste my time reading whatever the thing you just said is. That's all I ask. You know, when you say something, make it worthwhile. But in the very least, to rein this back over to Otakon, uh, ever since our little rant, uh, we talked to some people at Otakon. And for all of you who are wondering, there, it is very, very likely that we are going to be doing a decent number of panels and shows at Otakon. We, obviously, we don't know for sure yet, but... It looks pretty good. Yeah, so for anyone out there, let's let's do a quick rundown here. Uh, on, let's see, hold on. I got to fill up the calendar. Yes. On June 23rd, we are most likely going to be at the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art Arts Festival. We are not going to be doing anything there except attending, the same way you will be attending if yes. you go. We're, not, we're really basically going to be incognito, though if enough of we're you say- We're not incognito, we're just- Walking around from table to table going, OMG, you make that comic. OMG, you make that comic. OMG, your comic is awesome. Well, you know, I just realized that if we were webcomic artists, we could probably get away with that. Because just walking around, no one's going to recognize us unless we put our pictures online or go to cons a lot. But uh, we're podcasters. It wouldn't be too hard to find us at a con because we're usually doing exactly what we're doing right now, just in person. Yes. <laughs> uh, then in July, I'm not going to bother saying the dates, but we're going to... Kineticon. Where we will be doing, God, some stupid number of shows. Yes, it's we're going to be... get to Kineticon late Friday night, but we will remain there for the entirety of the con. Basically, if you want to see us do live shows, Kineticon's where you want to be, because we're doing most of the events we have gotten put together for this entire year at Kineticon. Yep. Then we're going to Anime Next, but I don't know how much we're going to Anime Next, because as far as I know, we're not doing anything well, at Anime Next. Well, here's the thing. Next. We complain about Otakon partly because we care a lot about Otakon. And while I like Anime Next, I'd never gone to it until last year, and it's, it wasn't really big on my radar, but I respect it as a con. At least Otakon got back with us at all. Yeah, Anime Next just didn't. Anime Next just ignored all my emails, and eventually I just said, all right, fine, screw it. I'm not doing shows for you. It's yeah, not so worth if, it. If I go to Anime Next, I'll probably pick one day of the con, probably the Saturday or the Sunday, and go just that day, probably because that is a day that will have events that I'm interested in. Yeah, well, we did that last year with uh, Katsu. We just kind of wandered around and had fun for the day. Yeah. Yeah, we'll probably it'll probably be more fun this year, even if it is the even if they ran the exact same con this year as they did last year. I think it'd be more fun just because it'll have things like Pokemans and such like that. Ah, Pokemans! I better finish training. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. No, I'm not even gonna bother. It's not yeah. worth it. But then Otakon. Well, once we know exactly what we're doing at the con, we'll uh, keep you guys appraised. Yeah, and then in December, 
the New York Anime Festival in the city. Where we're doing, so, so we're kind of doing the game shows we're doing at Kineticon, but bigger, faster, and more intense. Yeah, we don't know yet either, 100%. But well, we know that we're doing them. We just don't know how, what the size of the venue we'll be doing them in. Because part of that hinges on how well the new event goes at Kineticon, where they are graciously yeah. allowing us to beta test it. And then in February next year, Katsukon. Oh man, I gotta <laughs> say, I can't tell you what's going on at Katsukon next year. Other than that, the staff of Katsukon is already putting a lot of thought and effort into what's going on at Katsukon next year. Katsukon went from a oh, con that I know that's, you know, over there in DC, and I know about it, and I heard good things about, but never bothered with, to. Oh, man, that's the con. Suffice to say, there is an event that we are nominally planning that may or may not involve Anime World Order, despite the fact that we have not told them yet. We'll see if they actually show up. Yeah. They didn't go to the last (laughs) cut. Last two. Yeah. Or no, I think Daryl was at the one two ago. That's That's where you met him. Yeah, that's where I was in a drunken stupor, and I met him while he was interviewing people. And I was like, I'm a podcaster, too. Yeah, well, we can't uh, plan an event with them if they don't show. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we haven't even talked to them yet. So Gerald's probably going to be listening to this and be like, what we're doing at KatsuCon? Ah, shit. (laughs) But yeah, if this event, which I think is going to go through, goes through, Saturday night at KatsuCon is going to be one fucking thing. A fucking thing. It's something I actually proposed to Otakon and Kineticon. Kineticon, it was too late to put it together. Otakon, it's too late for us to put it together, so I rescinded it. But I think we can have it together by February, and I think it's going to be pretty hot. Yeah. All right. Uh, Oh, yeah. yeah, But uh, in the news, Otakon, they just announced that one of the guests is going to be Morio Asaka, the uh, Chobits director and a bunch of other stuff. Nana... Go look at the Anime News Network. There's a crazy list. As always, they get the big name awesome guest, and probably be fun to see the panel. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm not too excited about the guest. I mean, I like Nana, and I like some of the shows that this person is directing. Uh, Mermaid but... Scar, uh, Card Capture Sakura. Oh, God. Gunslinger Girls. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so it's like probably a cool- Monster. Storyboarded monster. Yeah, but that still matters. Yeah. I think while I like some of those works a great deal, I don't really don't know how interesting it's gonna be to see this person and most likely I'll won't go see them. Wow, you're just the cynical convoy tonight. Well, I mean think about it. Yeah, last Otacon I didn't see anybody. Last I didn't year care. Honestly, the only reason I didn't go to many events at Otacon last year was I was too busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's like the con is entertaining enough. I I don't you know, with the music acts and the alleys and the dealers and the us doing stuff that i don't really need to go see like the industry panel with the guest like this but well, for you other people out there who are not me this is awesome if you especially if you like these shows you can go meet the person who is probably the biggest part in making them and learn something well typically i like these sorts of things when there's a show i like that i actually have a question about mm. sadly the director some of the directors i would really like to uh touch in some way uh, don't come to the U.S. so often, or at least don't come near me. They're all they're all hang out on the West Coast at those cons we don't go to. Ah, uh-huh. all right. So check this out. I don't know. Did we talk about this, or did just every other podcast talk about the Nymphet manga? Uh, actually, uh, I don't know if it came up, but I totally forgot, or didn't know, or didn't talk about this. And had no idea what it was. Okay, to sum it up. There's a manga that's basically about, I guess it's about like an eight-year-old girl who sexually harasses her like 30-year-old teacher. And it's just a pedophile manga. It doesn't have any, it's it's not like some things that have fan service, like Ghost in the Shell, yeah, it has fan service and nakedness and lesbians, but it's not a perverted manga. It's mostly, you know, a sci-fi kind of thing. Just, so I'll, I'll give it one out, because I have no, I don't know anything about it. Is it... Lolita? Is it art or is it just porn? It's just porn. God. Nymphette is has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Other so you than read it to appeal to pedophiles. No, but that's <laughs> what I hear from every possible person uh, who uh, knows anything about it, and every place on the internet says that. Okay, so what you just said is some guy on the internet told me. Watch uh, for all we know, this is Hamlet. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's it's pretty much the worst thing ever, and uh, basically. They're going to make an anime of it this summer, right? Oh, God. Now, wait. It gets worse than that. It could, you didn't think it could be worse than making an anime of a, of a pedophile manga with no redeeming quality. Well, I can't imagine it's licensed for d- release in the U.S. No, no. Well, actually, the manga, that's, that was the news, was 
that last week or a couple of weeks ago was that the company putting out in the U.S. is, you know, facing some trouble and whatever. Oh, and, I wonder why. Yeah, anyway, here's the worst news. Ready? One of the episodes in the anime that they've made is unairable for reasons unsaid but easily implied. Probably full of naked little girls and pedophileness, I'm guessing. What about you? I don't know. I'd assume that it has uh, Grand Moff Tarkin doing something. Oh, okay. I mean, obviously. <laughs> They're going to take this unairable episode, and which I don't... You have to be a sick person to make something like that in the first place. So right? what, are they going to take a boat and just row it out there and then broadcast it back to Japan illegally? Nope. They're going to put it on a DVD, and if you buy the fourth volume of the manga, you're going to get this DVD with the unairable episode. Wow, so basically... If you buy all the manga, you get the child porn surprise at the end. Yeah. Um, now, see, I'm, I don't want people to be confused here because a lot of people seem to be confused about this position that we have when it comes to things like this. You know, I'm not pro-censorship. I think people have the freedom of speech and freedom of press and freedom of art expression, and they should be able to make this sort of thing if they want to yep. and read this sort of thing if they want to. And I will never advocate, you know, the government preventing anyone from reading, purchasing, or, you know, uh, airing any of these sorts of things. However... Yeah, on, well, the only line I have when it comes to art is if the creation of the art is demonstrably harmful exactly, to others. Exactly, exactly. You know, the I, same I think, limitations yes. you put on free speech. Yeah. yeah uh, in general. I mean, if, if Power Word Kill worked, uh, that word would be banned. Yeah, I mean, if there was some magical spell... A video in which someone says the magical spell and that summons a demon, I would not allow that video to be distributed because that would bring many demons into the world. Of course, you know the world. That video would be on YouTube more so than yeah, any exactly. other video. <laughs> regardless, regardless, my opinion is that if you are someone who makes, reads, well, I guess if you read it, you're not necessarily, but if you enjoy uh, or gain entertainment from this sort of work in any way, you are a sick uh, disgusting, worthless, uh, <laughs> dis disgusting human being. Very bad. And I would have uh, no qualms about killing you. In fact, I would think you were so subhuman that it's okay to kill you. I thought you. Human. I thought Trigun made you a pacifist. What? What? Where's the turnaround here? They're not a human. If you're like this, you're not human. I can kill uh, you. That's dangerous talk because that I don't want to spoil anything about no, no, Trigun. No. But I don't think it's it's dangerous talk to say someone who likes Nymphet is not human. Uh, I was just going to go so far as to say that they're pretty creepy and I probably wouldn't want to engage in conversation or share a bus stop with them. If you don't want to be hyperbolic, then yeah. Well, yeah, but <laughs> but if I don't want to be hyperbolic... <laughs> Regardless, if you like an infet, you're a sicko and I don't want to talk to you. I don't even like to see you. Don't Don't tell me that you like it because you're sick. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the first post in the forums. I read it. Oh my God. Well, it, it, see, like, I could understand if you just read it, like, because if someone read it out of curiosity to find out, like, what the hell was going on, I could understand that. It's kind of like watching M.D. Geist or Odin, despite being told not to. Exactly, exactly. Where it, it's the matter of if you read it and then you read volume two, or if you read it I, because I, it, you think, oh, that looks interesting. I think, I think. Now, now to paraphrase the words that were spoken by the official giving the wedding we went to the previous weekend... <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. Oh. Now, uh, you're all out there, and you're all listening to this, and you now know the name of this this work, and I the word work is definitely in quotes. Um, we all know that our favorite anime podcast out there is Anime World Order, and they review anime and manga. Uh, they know all about this Nymphet thing. Well, uh, They've been talking about it as well. Perhaps they need some sort of campaign to get them to review it. <laughs> Just send them a bunch of copies. That way, at least... Perverts won't be able to buy it. It'll be in good hands. <laughs> I mean, sure, the company that prints it will get money, but they already got the money because they sold it to the store. You see, they don't get paid when you buy it. They get paid when the store buys it. But now you're not punishing the store for buying it. That's buying true. It. But even so... In fact, if anything, if all, you're doing, all, is, all up, you're doing is punishing Daryl Surratt for existing. That's fine. <laughs> then you're actually, you know, doing it for a good cause. Things of the day. So there's been a lot of talk in the anime world recently about a 
a concept or an art style or a genre or whatever you want to make it out to be called Super Flat. Uh huh. And it seems like every person I run a foul of on the internet has a different idea of what Super Flat is or what Super Flat means. It seems to be one of those things where. Peep, some people seem to know it when they see it, but there isn't a... Much like pornography. Yes, but there isn't a, a strict definition. Like, this is what super flat is, and this is what it not is. And people have a hard time... If you say, hey, what's super flat? No one could just say what it is in simple terms. They're, it's always kind of vague. Like, is it a style of animation? Is it a, you know, I don't know, some new art wave movement? It, what, what exactly is it? Nobody can really say... Well, I can Even say what it is now. It. You because can say what it is? I'm pretty well, I can say by showing. Because uh-huh. I know it when I see it. Partly because it's called Super Flat. Aha. Uh-huh. By everyone. There you go. And a lot of people seem to link to this as kind of iconic of Super Flat. But then again, that's just what the internet says. What does it know? It knows so, everything, duh. It was actually Emily who showed me this, and it's really, really cool. Regardless of Super Flat, if you care or not, watch this video. Which I guess is meant to sell Louis Vuitton goods, but kind of gives me the impression that if you run afoul of these goods, you will be eaten by a psychedelic monster and sent into a fantasy land where monsters will steal your cell phone. And uh, yeah. So $5,000 handbags only exist in anime world? Uh, I'm not sure. Just watch it. I, I'm not sure how to explain it. Other than that, it's really pretty and it's kind of weird and it's really well done. And uh, that's about all I can say about it. All right. Well, I think it's time for yet another thing of the day from uh, the wonderful world of Japanese television. Oh, Japanese television that has given us such wonderful shows as Guy Trying to Pee gets uh, lofted out of the urinal or Guy Trying to Pee gets shot down a mountain on a sled or Guy Trying to Pee gets pulled out to sea by a boat. (laughs) Well... Uh, Japanese television, the infinite font of things of the day, has provided one more thing for us to uh, laugh at. Basically, what they've done is they set up a challenge. The challenge consists of a giant, I want to say treadmill, but it's more like a big conveyor belt. Like you know really those things big. at airports? Yeah. That when no one's looking, I run down as fast as I can. I run down as fast as I can when people are looking. Well, usually when people are they looking. They also have them at casinos. Ah, yeah. They didn't have them at the casino we went to. Yeah, they did. Where? Remember we used it? No. It was there. I don't remember in it at little, all. In a little tiny hallway. You know what? My memory is too clouded by all the money I won. You didn't win that much money. Uh, compared to how much money I came with, I doubled my money. And then you spent it at the bookstore. <laughs> no. No. I, I didn't <laughs> spend that money at the bookstore. I spent other money. I still yeah, had yeah, that money. I'm sure. Anyway, they set up this giant conveyor belt. Really big. And... On the side of it, there are, like, these four little platforms. And each platform has, I guess, a cookie on it or something like well, that. Well, one has a glass of water. One has a glass of water and a cookie, I think. And they put someone on the treadmill, and they have to run from one end of the treadmill to the other and also eat all the cookies and drink the water. And if they fall down or if they fail to eat the cookies or whatever, they're done, and they, they lose. But not only that, uh, something interesting happens to them when they lose, and I'll let you see that for yourself. The thing that bothers me about this particular challenge is I do not, while it is very entertaining and amusing, I am under the impression that it was not completely fair. Well, the- I think that they were controlling the speed of the treadmill manually, and basically, as people you know, got close to victory, they would turn it up more and more and more to make sure that nobody won. Granted... That's really the only way to run something like this. If you want, if you made it fair, you really missed out on a golden opportunity. It is true, but I do think what they should have just done is, okay, said, this is the level that we will set it at. Set it at a high level that, you know, maybe only a really awesome person could accomplish. Ah, see, you're but assuming do it the same every time. that this was intended to be a, a test of skill. You see, I'm of the mind more and more that Japanese game shows are not game shows. They don't, the people on the show... That doesn't they don't matter at all. They are basically just saps and they exist solely to entertain me. That may be true, but at the same time, I think it's sort of, you know, it, it entertains me more when it's a fair competition and the people still get fucked than if <laughs> than if it's a uh, designed to fuck them and they get fucked because, you know, it's like uh eh, they're all, they designed to get fucked. It's not so funny. Oh, they suck. Ha <laughs> ha, they suck. 
So, uh, funny moment one is when you realize that at the other end of the treadmill is a pool. Uh, I was gonna. I was oh, you're gonna keep that. it secret? I hid it, but now it's it's not hidden. Oh well, I if guess they, I if they go back fail and... at the treadmill, then the treadmill pushes them into a pool, and they go splooge. Two, the black dude is awesome. The black dude is my hero. <laughs> He's gigantic too. And they, how do these Japanese people even expect to be able to win this with their tiny, tiny legs? Only the black guy uh, with the giant legs can possibly have a chance. And even he, this. I'm not going to spoil what happens at the end, but suffice to say, it's a closely run affair. He's also the only person who knows how to run. I mean, one thing the Japanese people have the tiny legs, but they don't even know how to run. <laughs> no, the one guy did. Just the, the, the last person ran really oddly. I don't know what is up with these people who don't know how to run. Ready? Here's Scott's guide how to run. Ready? Move your legs back and forth as quickly as possible. Extend them as far as possible. Lift your knees as high as possible. Bend your freaking elbows and swing your arms in that's, time. That's uh, not how you run. That's, that's actually a run. pretty piss poor way to run. That's but, kind of inefficient. But what, see, these people who like they walk with their ar- they run with their arms like straight at their sides, not moving. They don't bend their knees at all, and they just kind of waggle their legs back and forth. Those people are fucked up. They didn't learn how Wasn't to... Wasn't there a Seinfeld about that? She just doesn't move her arms. Yeah, people just don't know how to move... They don't have motor skills. That's like the most basic skill before even literacy. Moving your body in the See, proper fashion. Now, I think in the trend of how I started talking about this, they missed one final golden opportunity. Now, if the final bit of the challenge had been, in fact, a urinal... <laughs> so... We brought up the U.S. presidential elections, rather serendipitously. For uh, tonight, we are going to talk about probably our second favorite manga of I all don't time. Know if it's the second favorite manga of all time. Well, uh, in the in the in this kind of the two manga that are like this that we have, it's the top ten manga of all time for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's definitely number two because I love it. I don't think it's quite as good as Sanctuary, but yet at the same time, I hadn't read it in a long time, and when I pulled it out to flip through it before we did the show. I remembered how freaking awesome it was. Yeah, I mean, it's and awesome. I kind of want to read it again. It's not as awesome as Sanctuary, Phoenix, Buddha, Akira, whatever. But after all those, this is the number one you've got left. So tonight we're going to talk a bit about Eagle, which... Uh, well, Eagle, colon, the, the making, making of, of an Asian American president. president. You see, Eagle is much like Sanctuary, only without the eroticism. And without the Yakuza. Yeah, and without the violence. It has some violence, but not much. Very little. Very little violence. It's pretty much just take the politicking and the human drama aspects of Sanctuary and spread them out over 2,000 pages, and you've got Eagle. Now, Eagle is basically the story of a young man named Takashi Joe, whose mom died, and he works for some newspaper in Japan. And for various reasons, he ends up getting the uh, shot of a lifetime. To head over to America and cover for Japan the uh, presidential campaign of Senator Yamaoka, who is a Japanese American Democratic senator who is running for president. Huh? That's pretty cool, right there. And uh, suffice to say, all is not as it appears. For there are hintings that perhaps his mother was murdered and didn't just die of her own accord and perhaps there are sinister things going on and perhaps to reveal any of them would be a huge spoiler yes and perhaps in fact the man the senator has a link to the young takashi joe that may or may not be true or may or may not be apparent or may or may not be important yep it's all sort of the manga tends to carry you along with a lot of things like tossing out these possibilities all over the place about all sorts of different things. It sort of feels a lot like a presidential campaign in a way, which where there are many rumors and rumors and hints of information. And then, oh, the actual information comes out. Dum, dum, dum. And then they do it again and again and again and again for many, many, many pages until it's over. Now, much like if Sanctuary were true, I would have joined the Yakuza as soon as I was able to get to Japan. And if Horatio Hornblower were true, I would have somehow constructed a time machine to go back in time and be some sort of seaman in the Navy. If Eagle were actually a portrait of how American elections work, I would be a politician. I would also maybe be a reporter. Yes, either one, because apparently reporters and politicians are all consummate badasses. Yep. Well, let's talk about the meta of this for a second. All right. Uh, It's made by... 
Kaiji Kawaguchi, the story and the art by one man and one man alone, the way manga should be. It was nominated for not one, not two, not three, not five, but four Eisner Awards. That's quite a many Eisner Awards. Best right new there. series, best continuing series, best writer artist, best U.S. edition of foreign material. Yep. They actually, this year, they changed the Best U.S. Edition of Foreign Material Award, and they have two of them now. This Best U.S. Edition of Foreign Material and Best U.S. Edition of Foreign Material Japan only. Because the Japan just kept winning, so they split it off. Um, basically, this guy, Kaiji Kawaguchi, went all around the U.S. on this big trip researching like how our politics worked in our country and all sorts of things in preparation to write this manga. And he was insp- it said that he was inspired to create the manga after watching some documentary about politics or something. I forget. I don't know. But if you look and you read this manga, it becomes immediately obvious to anyone who knows anything about the United States that this is a parody, I guess, of the 2000 presidential election in the U.S. Yes, it is definitely Al Gore who is the front-runner Democratic candidate. Yeah, he's na- they call him Al Noah. And they have uh, one of the uh, campaign advisors. It's George Tuck, based on Dick Tuck. And uh, oh, I think the best is guy- he gets he, he has these long conversations over the phone with uh, someone he obviously respects and trusts, who gives him political advice, named just Bill. And Bill happens to be from Arkansas, and he's also the current president. And he has some scandals, and he has a wife named Ellery. And Ellery. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of obvious. It's sort of supposed to be obvious. It's just avoiding, I guess, libel and lawsuits and things like that. Yeah, well, also, while that way they get a lot of the setting of American politics, at the same time, all the events from American politics don't end up overshadowing what's really going on because this is not about... Al Gore versus George Bush. It's about the primaries and Al Gore and this Japanese American senator and all the other Democratic candidates all vying for the presidency, for the nomination, and then the presidency, which that part is actually not really quite as climactic as the primaries are. Yeah. The, basically, the thing starts out like as the primaries are just beginning, like people are just deciding if they're going to run or not. And it goes as far as it goes, because we're not going to spoil how far it goes. Now, there's some things that this has in common with Sanctuary. A lot of things. Uh, The art is similar. I think it's a little bit simpler, but I also really like it. It's kind of charming. And it definitely, it's almost nothing but inspirational close-ups of characters talking. Almost nothing. Pretty much every single panel, not every single panel, but most panels, like, they really highlight the person's faces. And... Uh, Kawaguchi is really good at drawing like these powerful faces that stand out, you know, so you just want to look at them and they're like, BAM! You know, it's like someone's face just sort of like explodes with like the radiant light coming from it in every single panel. Like, someone gets up behind a podium to make a speech and it's like their head is glowing and <laughs> someone looks at someone with like a look that really means something that you don't, you don't need to put words around, you know, uh, you don't need to make them say something to get the meaning across because of the way he gets the expressions with the eyes, you know, and stuff like that. So it's really just panels of faces for the majority of the art. And I don't really have a problem with that. Yeah. Plus, if you flip through, whenever there are people in the background or extras or just other people around, if they're ever close up in scene, many times they'll all have unique faces and be very specifically drawn differently from people around them instead of just, you know, faceless people in the background. Yeah. All the non-faces are sort of drawn, I guess, normally. I mean, the proportions of the bodies are pretty accurate and... You know, you don't go, hey, why is that guy arm half as long as the other arm and stuff like that. But it's not particularly awe striking in any way. It's it's pretty standard stuff. Like now, another thing that really makes it similar to Sanctuary is the. Hey, look, there's an ad for Sanctuary in the back of this volume of Eagle. Really? Yeah. Wow. But anyway, there in Sanctuary, there was definitely this trend where anyone who opposed the main characters would eventually either die. Or join them. There seems to be this whole thing of, like, anyone who's smart will join the good guys in their quest. And it's very difficult for smart people to deal with fighting against the main characters. And that sort of thing happens a lot in the early parts of both Eagle and Sanctuary. 
Yeah, there's a great part where one of my favorite parts is when uh, Yamaoka goes to Texas. Oh, where, yeah. Where he's not very welcome. And he goes to, like, you know, a saloon where he's not very welcome because of his uh, gun control policy. And then he pretty much does awesome stuff to uh, rally these cowboys. And I won't say any more than that. Yes. It, uh, I really don't want to ruin anything about this. And I think it's good that I haven't read it very recently. Otherwise- because I can't ruin it because I barely... I, the fact that I remember that scene says a lot because I don't remember many of the scenes. I remember the basic plot and... The scenes that struck me particularly over I remember others. when what I thought was the climax happened. I thought, okay, I know what's going on. And then the manga did a 180. And then I remember sitting there thinking, what the fuck? Yeah. What? And then when it, was, when I, when it ended and I actually read the end, I was quite surprised at yeah, how, at how there, it turned I'm not going to say anything, but there's, there, was, there is a big twist at the very, very end of Eagle that I did not see coming, but it makes perfect sense. And it's pretty awesome. And I think without that, this manga would be half as good. And uh, uh, it's, it makes it worth reading the whole thing, even though I think the uh, earlier part of the manga has a lot more meat than the later volumes, except for the uh, explosive ending. Now, luckily, while it's very deep politics, I mean, there's a lot of talk about specific parts of the primaries or press relations and all these very, very deeply involved in politics things. And yet... You don't need to know a lot of politics to get it because whenever it's kind of like when you watch a show like ER where there's a lot of buzzwords and jargon and even if they're used correctly and even if you don't really know what they mean all the same ER uses medical terms correctly sometimes (laughs) yeah and CSI is real detective work people I guess Hornblower is a better example but you'll get the sense that you know what's going on and with the context you'll figure it all out there's really even it's very you, accessible. You can understand what's going on without being a political expert and, or, in fact, without knowing anything about U.S. politics. I mean, this is a manga. This is made for Japanese people who know a lot less about American politics than even, like, an American high schooler is supposed to. So it's, it's not hard for you reading this translated into English to know what's going on. But sadly, the one thing that doesn't really bother me but definitely colors my perception of reading this is that it feels like it was written – From the perspective of someone who saw events happening and understood how things work in politics, but didn't really understand how things really work. Because it's so idealistic and it's so, yes, this good person will prevail. Yes, if you give a good speech and you're passionate, then people will care. And it seems to... I wish American politics were like Eagle. Oh, I, God. You don't know how much I wish American politics were like Eagle, because then I'll be the president. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have the book right here that tells me how to do it. All right. So if you want to get Eagle, it's not... I'm not sure... I'm pretty sure it's not in print. Uh, I'm pretty sure of that. But it is also not hard to find. I actually see this a lot more often than I see Sanctuary. Now, it's printed by Viz back in the day, and it reads left to right, which is... Fine, because, you know, sure, I'd rather have it be right to left, and I'd rather have... But Yamaoka was supposed to be facing the rising sun, but now he's facing the setting sun. Ah. Yeah, and I'd rather have it, uh, you know, keep sound effects intact, but really there aren't that many sound effects, so it's not, you know, it's not the action uh, book here. It's mostly a political talking book. But there's Viz printed, as far as I know... Eagle in two different formats. And one format consisted of many smaller books. Like the books were maybe like, I don't know, 20 or 30 pages big. And there are like 30 something of these books. There are a whole bunch of them. And you'll know if you see one because it'll say Eagle and it'll be about a centimeter thick maybe. Or maybe even less than that. Don't buy those. Now, I mean, you might be able to get them all. But because they're kind of like I see random ones all over the place, and I'm sure if I had bought every one I've ever seen in my life, that now I would have them all or close to all of them, and I probably could have picked up the missing ones online. But who wants thirty little tiny books? Because Viz later printed the entire thing in five giant books that are very relatively easy to find, cheap, especially at cons because people don't respect this manga and they put it on the discount rack and. It, I even see them at New York comic book stores all the time. And online, I see them on Amazon and places all the time. And you can just get them for like less than 20 bucks each, five giant books. You can have all of Eagle, all 2,000 pages for under $100. I I can't stress enough, if you at all have any interest in this, find the first one somewhere and read it. 
And if you like that, I guarantee you'll like the rest because it only gets better from there. Yeah, you're buying a giant book, so, you know, buy just one to see if you like it first. Because while we think it's awesome, I don't think everyone would think it's awesome. If you like the Naruto... Yeah, communists. Yeah, yeah if you like Naruto, <laughs> and that's like your favorite thing ever, I don't know if you're going to like Eagle. It's sort of... The exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because this one fight does take most of the manga. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot of, his, well, his voting rating is over 9%. 9%? Yeah, yeah. He's up in the polls. He's down in the polls. OMG, he gave a speech. He had to eat two dinners in oh, one night. Oh, the two dinners in one night. That was one of the best scenes. That was awesome. I love that scene. That was awesome. Two dinners in one night. <laughs> You're not, I mean, you think it's badass when, I don't know, someone pilots a robot with one arm and destroys an entire battleship and loses their own physical leg and saves their best friend from dying, but then their best friend dies anyway. You think that's badass? Or you think it's badass when, like, Kenshiro, like, punches a thousand times a second? <laughs> you have not seen someone eat two five course meals in one night. That is the most badass. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.